Welcome everyone to the next iteration of the IIT seminars. Today, it is my pleasure to have Jürg Spak around from University of Koblenz, Landau, and he's going to be talking about some work he's been doing along with Sebastian Schreiber on uh, modern exclusion theory, or modern non-coexistence theory. So without further ado, Jürg, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. So um, I guess Giri has already said everything about the, the title slide, so let's dive into it. Or maybe not. Oh, okay. Um, yes, so modern coexistence theory, as I guess most of you are aware, is about coexistence. So it's an attempt to explain the biodiversity that we observe in nature. Now, <clears throat> um, so more specifically, let's assume we have a community. And then with this community, let's focus for now on that the insect community would have these four insects that somehow, and we're not going to look into this into more detail, they compete for the natural resources. So we could then measure these um, the species pair interactions and we get this co competition graph. Now, however, if we actually think about biodiversity, we should, we, and we look a little bit closer into in, in this local environment, we'd probably also find some sort of predator. In this case, we have a spider which consumes the, the, the grasshopper at the end, or we could also include other biotic interactions. I've included, for example, a bee. The bee would facilitate the plants that are eaten by the caterpillar and the, and the grasshopper, and it would in turn also be eaten by the spider. So this is our um, imaginary local um, ecosystem food web, however you want to call it. And now modern coexistence theory would like to try to explain to us how this community coexists. Now, there is a problem with it. Um, so the, the typical approach to then um, assess this coexistence, there are kind of two lines of thought. One of them would be uh, the niche and fitness differences, which is what I'm going to mainly focus on. Um, and there would also be the, the relative non-linearity and storage effect line of thought. And most of the talk that I'm going to talk today about will also apply to this, but I've decided myself to focus on niche and fitness differences, mainly because it reflects more of my expertise. So to, to understand this community, we, we would, or a scientist doing modern coexistence theory would like to analyze these niche and fitness differences of this community. And what is typically done is you could then take a, a species pair out of these. So in our case, we would focus on the, the ant and the caterpillar. We would compute the niche and fitness differences of these two species, and then we get one dot in our graph. And then we can continue to add another community. So for example, the snail and the, and the ant, and then we can continue to map all these two species communities and we get our graph. Um, so this, this is what, what, what modern coexistence theory explains biodiversity is typically what is done in, 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 in papers currently. Now, there are two main issues with that. The first one is that we very often see in these, in these papers, we see communities that are above these, this coexistence threshold. So modern coexistence theory would predict that these two species pairs, so the caterpillar with a snail or the caterpillar with the ant, cannot coexist. This is despite the fact that we have locally found these communities. And, and this is a kind of a, a, a recurrent problem in modern coexistence theory. We go to a local community, we compute these niche fitness differences, and then we very often find that there are communities that, that modern coexistence theory pr would predict to not co-occur. And then the other thing is out of these six species that we have found locally in our, in our local community, we've actually only focused on four of them and two of those species so the, the the spider the predator as well as the bee kind of the mutualist um are not included into our analysis so it gives us an incomplete picture and a potentially misleading picture as as two, two of the species pairs are not considered to be coexisting um a little bit more like a little bit more more concrete analysis i've done with a with a Previous master student Lisa Bushi, I've done a, we've done a, a literature review and we found 29 papers that ex experimentally analyzed niche and fitness differences, and out of those, 28 focused on pairwise niche and fitness differences, and there's only one application of multi-species niche and fitness differences to empirical data. Um, 
25 out of those 29 papers have focused on primary producers. So this would be plants and phytoplankton. So this, this example of the spider and the bee being excluded is, is very much how uh, modern coexistence did how the current state of knowledge in modern coexistence theory. Four of those papers have focused on other organisms, so yeast and bacteria. However, um, even those which do focus on like non-primary producers, the way it's actually been done is that these species have been competing for resources given by, by humans. So, they're, so the yeasts do not actually compete for, uh, they're not actually in their natural environment, rather they're like, I think it's petri dishes um, um, and also bacteria, but certainly by, like by human supplied resources. So in a sense, they're ecologically still similar to primary producers. Um, now there is a, there are good reasons of, of why this is that way, and specifically there are historically two reasons why modern coexistence theory has been focused very much on these two species communities, and it's been difficult to apply the concepts of modern coexistence theory to multi-species communities. Um, specifically, the the first one is the niche and fitness differences when they've been originally defined, depending on who you ask, when exactly this was, uh, this was like maybe 1990 or 2008, um, we have these well-known uh, um, equations for niche and fitness differences, but very importantly, they're pairwise. And it's not entirely obvious from these pairwise um, uh, definitions of niche overlap and fitness differences, how you would generalize it. Um, luckily, however, this has been done. And so this is not part of the talk today. So either you could use the method proposed by Carol, uh, Carol in 2011, or myself have uh, proposed a method that allows to compute niche and fitness differences for multi-species communities and also communities where you have different trophic levels or facilitation going on. So in principle, that one is fine. Similarly, the other line of thought, the, the storage effect and relative nonlinearity they have probably at the beginning been like most used in, in this two species context. And they have been, it, I guess it would have been possible to apply those equations to multi-species communities, but it would have been very complicated because the equations were not straightforward and they would um, require analytic mathematics, which, which would just would lead to very long equations. But also this problem has essentially been solved by um, Steve Elder et al in 2019, where they propose a method which is based, which basically replaces the, the analytic derivations with um, computer simulations. So the, the first problem that these metrics of modern coexistence theory have mainly been defined for two species communities is essentially solved. And we could just from that point of view, move on to more complicated multi-species communities. The second issue is that both these solutions, they depend on the invasion growth rates. So the invasion growth rates, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later, is the idea that if you have your community, you remove one species and you ask whether the species can come back in. However, these invasion growth rates, they are sometimes undefined in species-rich communities. So undefined meaning that if you have your community, if in our case, of these six um, insects, you remove one, there is no guarantee that the other one will still be there. Or even if it is, um, it might not match. So the invasion growth rates might not match with the actual coexistence outcome of the community. And this second um, problem is still open. And I'm going to talk today about a, a potential solution, which goes uh, uh, quite a step further. Um, basically, the mathematical um, work has been done by Sebastian Schreiber and Joseph Hofbauer, and I present my like my uh, my work with Sebastian of, uh, Sebastian Schreiber, where we attempt to bring this mathematical derivative to the modern coexistence theory world. Okay, so we back up a little bit for everybody who is not very familiar with with modern coexistence theory and the invasion growth rate approach. So we have the invasion growth rate approach is we have here the, the community of the six species, which for now we assume they can coexist actually. And then the invasion growth rate is just you remove one of the species. So for example, we remove the bee and then we ask 
um, first, can these community can this community still coexist? And then, as a next step, could the bee reinvade? And then we ask this the same for a spider. What happens if we take out a spider? And then similarly, we take out each species, each of the possible species we take out. And then for each of these now six subcommunities, for the six species that we took out, we ask, well, can the species that we took out, can it reinvade or not? And this is the naive invasion growth rate approach, which works very well for two species communities because then essentially taking one species away, you're just left with one, tree, one species and it turns out that they're very often it works just fine. Um, and it has been shown or it's less clear how this applies or very often we run into problems when we want to apply this to multi-species communities. Specifically, I guess one of the most frequent problem is that even if all the six species can coexist together, there is no guarantee that all, uh, all these sub-communities would coexist. So in our case, we could assume that, for example, the, um, like these three communities, they would not be able to exist, for example, because the spider depends on um, the, the grasshopper and the caterpillar to have sufficient food. So this is where invasion growth rate fails. And then the, the, the mathematical work by Sebastian Driver and Joseph Hofbauer is, um, is based on the permanence theory and instead of focusing only on those, we just basically make the entire assembly graph. So for this, we've, we start with no species present. And then we ask, so this is the empty state, the empty um, ecosystem. And then we ask, well, which of those species could actually invade? And in our case, I have assumed that this would be um, all five species expect, except the spider, because the spider, it does not have the, 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 the species that it would like to consume yet. So these five species could invade. And this leads us to five sub-communities that are uh, the, the five feasible sub-communities. And then for, for each of these five feasible sub-communities, we can again ask, well, for example, for the community where we have only the bee, what would happen if the, the snail invades? What would happen if the caterpillar invades and so on? And we would get from there secondary like invasions and we would go to these two species communities. Um, and again, maybe not all of them could invade, right? So for example, here I've still assumed that the, the, that the spider would not have sufficient food to eat the bee, so there is no bee spider community. And similarly, we do this for all the other communities and we get um, like this emerging graph where we now have the first, like the, the, the first, uh, the communities with one species and the communities with two species. And again, we can ask essentially the same question um, in the community of the, the bee and the snail, which species can invade? And I've assumed these two can invade. We do this for all the communities and we get this um, growing um, graph. We call this the, uh, no, the invasion graph, we call it. Um, yes, and then we basically build it from, from bottom up until we reach this um, uh, like prior to last level where we have five species. And then we would have the, what, what are used in the naive invasion growth rate approach, the invasion growth rates into these N minus one communities, which lead up to the final community. And now comes something that is quite important to, to like to understand. So previously, the naive invasion growth rate approach would focus on th these like the, the invasion growth rates into the N minus one communities. And then if all are positive, it was used as a heuristic or we assume that the community would coexist. This entire graph here, however, is different. It is mathematically proven that if for each sub-community here, you have at least one species that can invade, then you do have coexistence. And there, there are some additional assumptions that I will go into a little bit later, but it's important to, to see the difference that previously it was a heuristic. We assumed that this would be lead to coexistence, whereas now we have a proof that indeed if into each of these sub-communities we have at least one species that can invade, we do get coexistence. Um, yes, this is going to be important because down the road we'll actually kind of come back. Well, I don't want you to, to confuse these two approaches where one was like one is mathematically uh, precise and the other one was heuristic. So if we now I have this invasion graph. What this essentially means is that the, this last problem is solved. Um, specifically, there were two problems. One is what if not all of them, um, right? What if what if their um, the invasion growth rates are undefined? 
we basically, it, it doesn't matter anymore. We just focus on ones that are defined and then we have it. And, the, and then the, the second issue was sometimes it does not match with coexistence. This one is also solved because we have this mathematical proof that indeed we will get coexistence out of it, or actually more precisely, we'll get permanence out of it. Um, good. Now, there is a caveat namely that previously we had for a six species community, we would get six invasion growth rates and we would analyze them, which is somewhat a tangible amount of information. However, now we do have a lot of invasion growth rates. So we would have specifically for a for an N species community, you would ha have N time N minus one. So it's, it grows exponentially the number of invasion growth rates. And while we can now assess whether the species to exist, it's not entirely clear whether we can understand this coexistence. So, as a next step to, to kind of understand this coexistence, we would like to understand, well, which of these invasion growth rates are actually the important ones about which one should we really care? Which one should we analyze with a plotting coexistence theory? And this is now somewhat subjective. We, will, we have already shown that the community can coexist and I would like to understand it. We ask, well, in which of these invasion growth rates is contained the most information? Um, it's not to assess coexistence. We already know that species coexist. We want to understand why they coexist. And to do so, let's say we start with the entire community and then we remove one species. Um, so in the first case, we would say we remove the spider. Well, if the spider is removed to get back to the full community, well, the spider would have to reinvade. So we, we would go along this invasion growth rate. Um, the next example, we say, well, what would happen if this, the B is removed? Well, if the B is removed, we would have to go through this invasion growth rate. And then lastly, if the ant is removed, we would have to go through this invasion growth rate. So far, pretty much exactly what we would have done previously. Now, this is where we, things would differ. We could ask, well, what happens if we remove uh, the grasshopper? And previously, the answer would have been, well, we don't know what happens because the, the, the N minus one community for the grasshopper does not exist. Um, he would say, well, we can, we can remove it and we can see what happens. Well, if we were, were to remove the grasshopper, it would go to this community, probably. And then we could wait like to community to reassemble. And then first we'd go through this invasion growth rate and then it would go through this invasion growth rate, but it, it would have to go through this invasion growth rate, right? Similarly, if we remove the snail, it would go to either this or this community, you don't know. But anyway, if it reassembles, always before we reach the full community, it has to go through one of these final uh, invasion growth rates. And, this, and the same, obviously, I guess it's kind of obvious, um, if we were to remove the caterpillar, we would go to these communities, but the reassembly would always lead us through these, um, through one of these last invasion growth rates. So therefore, we argue we should focus on this last invasion step. We think that um, these potentially hold the most information about coexistence. So very importantly, this is we, we we admit that this is subjective. You could come up or potentially in your in your community, there might be a reason why you think another invasion growth rate is the most important one. That is that, that is fine. We're happy to disagree there. Or like even like maybe this is this is valid and you could go there. But we're not focusing on these, like contrary to the previous approach, we're not focusing on these last ones because they hold in because they tell us where the community coexists. Rather we focus on them because we think they contain most information. It's most uh, we can learn most about it. And if we focus on this last invasion step. And this is so what, I, what I've told you so far is, is pretty much like everything like we we we, we propose to change Monaco existence theory. And um, what comes afterwards is mainly some examples. So to recap, the if we previously had, if we like the, the traditional Monaco existence theory would have, we have these three um, species, we want to understand them. So remove each species, and then we compute the invasion growth rates, and then we apply our modern coexistence theory metrics, either niche and differences or relative nonlinearity. Um, what we now propose is you compute the entire invasion scheme. So you compute all the possible subcommunities, and then for each of those subcommunities, you compute all the invasion growth rate. Then, given these invasion growth rates, you would compute the invasion graph, um, which is basically. I'll define it later exactly what we mean by that. But basically, it's like if you're from this community, if the species invades, you would come to this community. Intuitively, very simple. And then there's this kind of 
tiny caveat, we hope that there are no cycles in recitation growth rate. So no rock, paper, scissors going on. And where you could jump from this community to that, and then from that to that, and then from that back to that. If you do, we are not entirely sure yet how to solve this. Half power criterion might be a good way forward, but we're not entirely sure how modern to existing theory then would deal with this half power criterion. So for now, we assume we have no cycles. Then if you have this, 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 uh, this invasion growth, uh, invasion graph, we could focus on the maximal subcommunity that can coexist. And then from this maximal subcommunity that can coexist, we could then focus on the last um, step to, to apply our modern coexistence theory metrics. And then the, the, the modern coexistence theory metrics that we apply will be exactly the same. Um, so now an important question is, well, what has actually changed, right? I've now talked for, I don't know, 10, 15-ish minutes, and it appears as almost nothing has changed. And I partially agree with you. So for two species communities, nothing has changed, which is good news, because specifically this means that all the empirical work we've already done with two species communities, nothing has changed for them. We do not have to redo all that work. For multi-species communities where we already have applied modern coexistence theory, nothing has changed either um, because we already could have applied modern coexistence theory, meaning that all these last invasion growth rates uh, existed. Otherwise, we couldn't have had applied modern coexistence theory. So nothing changes there as well, which is, again, good news. So for the, for the few examples that we have, nothing changes, which is, again, good news. We do not have to redo this work. Um, the important new step is that we can now apply modern coexistence theory to more complicated communities, specifically including trophic networks where typically the invasion growth rates will not be defined because um, if you remove the, the prey of the predator, you would not get you, you do not get your n minus one community. Similarly for all uh, obligatory mutualists and generally for very species rich communities. Um, yeah, so so it's. It's not that much about what has changed, it's more about what can we now do, which was previously impossible. And we're gonna show you two examples um, where we've done this. Um, so one example is we can now analyze the entire communities instead of a sub-community. As I've told you in the introduction, let's assume we have our four species community. What monoco system theory typically has done in the past is they would analyze, well, can these two species coexist? Can these two species coexist? Can these two species coexist? And so on. So we've done that with an example of a, a four species community. And um, we've computed all the, the species pairs and we find three of the species pair that can coexist, right? So we've computed niche fitness differences. And for this community, uh, both are below this, this, this red uh, dashed line, which is the coexistence uh, boundary and three communities are not. Now, our proposition is instead of doing that, which gives us this incomplete understanding of, uh, of existence, we would compute the entire invasion graph. And, and then we would actually find that yes, species one and four, as well as species three and four, they can coexist. But if you have them coexisting, actually, so let's go here, species one and four, species two would actually invade and you would reach species one and two. So it's kind of an incomplete story of saying species one and four can coexist because while they can coexist, you would, in this case, you would not observe, rather you would observe community one and two. And species three and four could then not invade into, into this uh, community. So actually this is like the community, the community assembly graph of the, of the species that can coexist. And this would be the niche and fitness differences that we would get out of it. So specifically we'd see this is species one, this is species two, they are below this coexistence. Uh, threshold and then species three and species four, they cannot invade because they're, oh, well, I guess because they cannot invade, they're above this coexistence threshold. So we get an understanding of the entire community at once as opposed to this fragmented understanding of the community. Um, this is a second example with a little bit more species. We have six species in this entire community. Um, this is the entire invasion graph. We see that species one, two, four, five, and six. Um, they can coexist, species three is excluded. Then we can, if we focus on like, uh, on this subcommunity where we have only the, the community with one, two, four, uh, one, two, four, five, and six, we get this graph and we see that species, now I have to think, species, so species two has an N minus one community, it's this one. And species one also has an N minus one community, it's this one, but for example, species five and six do not have an N minus one community. So now, because we only focus on 
So we know we now know that this community can coexist because the invasion graph is such that for each community at least one species can invade. Now we, to understand this, we focus on this invasion graph and this uh, this invasion growth rate and this invasion growth rate to understand the niche and fitness differences of species one and species two. And we would get this graph where this is species one, this is species two, they can coexist with each other. Um, and then this is species three, which is excluded. Species four, five, and six are not included in this graph because um, they are not, so, so the, essentially they do not form an n-1 community. They do not form an n-1 community because they're essential to the community coexistence. So if, meaning if you remove one of them, they're not the only one that goes extinct, rather multiple species will go extinct, which is why um, we say it is fine to focus on species, uh, species one and species two for our understanding of coexistence. Um, yeah, so these were the two examples. Now, now that I hope I've convinced you that this is, a, this is a nice tool, we can go a little bit more to the technical details of, of how we actually define this in invasion scheme and then the invasion graph. So for the invasion scheme, um, we assume our typical um, per capita growth rates. So this is, um, which is this per capita growth rate as a function of N. This is the density of the species. And then we have some auxiliary variables, whatever you want, such as um, resources, predators, habitat suitability, and so on. So anything that, you, that is not on the focal, uh, is not a focal species. And similarly, we have for the auxiliary, var auxiliary variables, we have um, a, a dynamics that, uh, that governs them as well, which as well may depend on the, on the species density as well as on the, the variables themselves. And then given this, we can compute any stationary stable state or uh, an equilibrium which then defines a subcommunity. So for example, we could ask, well, what is, if species one and two are there, is there a stationary state where these two species are there together? And uh, yes, so, so we, we define this for all possible combinations of subcommunities. And then we can define the invasion scheme as the invasion growth rates into, into this uh, equilibrium. Um, yes, and then by assumptions, as you, as you see here, when, when, so here species one is missing, then species one would obviously have zero invasion growth rate because it is in this stationary state. Um, one technical assumption that we have about this invasion scheme is that if, um, if you have a subcommunity of consisting of say species one and two, there might be multiple of these stationary states, right? There is no, there is no guarantee that there will be only one um, feasible equilibrium or, or, or or uh, uh, but you could have multiple of them. And our assumption is that independent of which of those states you choose, the invasion growth rates will always have the same sign. And this is an assumption. The, um, the good thing is, there, there are kind of two good things about this assumption. First, if you have a logical terra system, this assumption is always guaranteed because of logical terra is just is linear averaging. And the second thing is, while there certainly are communities where this is not the case, um, I would argue that modern ecosystem theory has not yet gone into those communities where this is a real issue. So while this may be a problem in the future, it's probably not a future yet. Uh, it's probably not a, an issue yet. And um, there might be hope that we'll get somehow rid of this assumption at some point. And then if we have this invasion scheme, we can define the invasion graph. Whereas the vertices of this invasion graph are all these subcommunities that we've previously talked about, some subcommunities will not be here, right? So, for example, the community consisting of species one through five is not here, is not a vertex in this invasion graph, and that's completely fine. That's not an issue. And then we define it's the directed edges of this graph, which is you can go from community S to T if. Well, basically, if it's possible to get to, intuitively, it's very easy. If you can go there by invasion is, is, is what the condition is. But more specifically, more technically, is for all species. So, so here, species two would not be in this previous community. Species two indeed has a positive invasion growth rate. That's fine. And then the other, if, for, if you would have um, species that are here but not here, so an example would be here. So here you have species one, three, four, and six. And you have species one, two, four. So you lose species three. Um, the condition is that you can go down is that species three would have a negative invasion growth rate into this community. So when you lose species, you actually lose them and you can't reinvade. 
Um, yes, and then importantly, this is important. This this maybe is some like at least let's say it was confusing to me at the beginning. Um, we also allow multiple invasions at the same time. This is, is from maybe from an ecological point of view somewhat unusual, but it's just for the mathematical theory it's necessary. So these are the gray arrows where, for example, you could go also directly from this community, you could go directly to here, or also from, in our case, you could go from the empty community, you could go directly to, to this um, full community. Um, yes, so th these are also in this invasion graph. Whereas typically we would probably not include them. Um, and then to assess permanence. So first we should we should check whether the invasion graph is cycle free. Um, so we should have no rock, paper, scissors. If there are cycles, we can try half power criterion or try half power criterion on each cycle individually to assess coexistence, but we're not entirely sure yet how we would then apply the methods of modern coexistence theory. And then to check whether the community is permanent, you have to simply check whether each into each community at least one species can invade. If it can, then you have to, you have permanence. So uh, mathematically proven, it's not it's not a heuristic anymore. It's mathematically proven. Um, yes. Then let's go to the conclusion. So what we have achieved, or I guess this is um, so this would not be me. This is already completely done in the paper of. Bastian Schreiber and Joseph Hofbauer, we have a robust definition of coexistence, specifically called permanence, and the invasion growth rates are saved. Um, we change, this changes how we assess coexistence, but this does not change how we interpret coexistence. So the entire modern coexistence part stays the same. So in, in a sense, we've not really done modern coexistence theory, we've only like done the step before modern coexistence theory. Um, importantly, for communities, so for the two species communities that we already have dealt with a lot, and for the few multi species communities that we have dealt with, nothing has changed. Um, but we, oh, sorry, but we can now do it for more communities that were previously not um, uh, possible, specifically for more complicated communities with multi trophic communities um, uh, or facilitation going on that were previously tricky because often uh, uh, the invasion growth rate was not defined. And very importantly for anybody who is actually now interested in applying this, we provide automated um, computer code, which is essentially most of the heavy lifting. So the computer code is available in Python and in R. And um, what it does is if you give the, we, we have not, so for a logical terror community, we've automated the, the, everything essentially. You can only give us the, 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 the interaction matrix and the, and, uh, the intrinsic growth rates, and then it gives you the entire um, computation of the invasion scheme and invasion graphs. For any other community model, um, you would have to come with the invasion scheme because it's, um, I don't think you could generalize this for any possible community model to come up with the invasion scheme. But if you have the invasion scheme, we will do the rest of computing the invasion graph, tell you which community is permanent and whether the species exists. Um, yes, and that is it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Jürg. Uh, if anyone has questions, uh, let me know. Uh, raise your hand in the participant list and I will call on you. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, Chris, please go ahead. Hi, yeah. Thank, thanks for the talk. It's really, really exciting. With my sort of empirical hat on, how robust is this to uncertainty in the, the growth rates and the competition coefficients that you're feeding into this? Can it sort of deal with essentially trying lots, lots of options, doing a kind of brute force strike with variations without giving you something useful? Or do you need to have them really quite nailed down? So... So from, we, so we do not change anything on the modern coexistence theory part. So if you want to compute niche and fitness differences, what I've seen over and over again is that we have these really large uncertainties. This does not change anything on that, right? Because we do not change how we compute niche and fitness differences. Um, there is, however, a potential like additional problem that comes because basically if you, so 
what I would do, I've not done it because it's like super new to me as well, is if you want to, oh, okay. So you, you would like to compute this invasion graph, but you have your uncertainties and parameters. This very likely means that depending on your parameter values that you take, let's say you take Bayesian approach and you, you sample, you would get a different invasion graph for each sampling that you do. And that might be an issue. And I am not entirely sure how, like I can tell you how I would do on the spot because I've thought a little bit about it, but I'm not sure what it's actually the best idea. So I, what I would probably do is I just, I would um, do this over and over again, compute niche infinite difference for every time I do it. And then I guess I would get the distribution of how often I would get this community as coexisting, how often I would get this community as coexisting. So you could certainly do this, and then you could also like assuming that this community coexists, you could then compute niche infinity differences for assuming that this community coexists. You, you could compute niche infinity differences assuming that this community coexists. Yes, but I probably probably it would add to the uncertainty that we already have, which is you know yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Let's see, Axel, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Jörg. I'm, I'm always, um, when Sebastian Schreiber gave his presentation some time ago, or, uh, I was struggling with it, and now I'm struggling again, which is to understand what is the purpose of this. And I, I've, uh, after Sebastian, I, I, I decided the purpose is to prove coexistence, even if dynamics are very complicated. If I have an equilibrium, it's easy, but if things are kind of moving around very complicated, I'm not sure if something will fly out eventually. And, and, and this is beautiful, that works. But, but is there anything beyond that that I can use it for? Yes, so I would, the, the way I see it is that indeed the, the, the work that Sebastian Schreiber and Joseph Hofbauer have done is indeed if you have your complicated community that does weird things, can we check whether there is coexistence? Yeah. And, and and like I guess we both agree this is this is kind of useful, but is there more to it? And I would say that the work that I have now done with Sebastian Schreiber is is actually so it depends on on this assessment, but it is actually quite a step further. So specifically, you would have let's let's say you have this community. We could very, very easily check that this community exists. This is very easy because it was a logical Altera community. And indeed, as you say, you can just compute the equilibrium and say, fair enough, we're done. Um, but then I would say, well, OK, so it does coexist. But I would like to understand a little bit more why does it coexist. Specifically, I would like, because I'm a fan of modern coexistence theory, I would like to understand the niche and fitness differences of this community. This is, I now assume, like for me, this is personally, this is just interesting. I'd like to understand it. There would be some additional reasons why you would be interested in doing that. For example, you can then compare it to other communities. So let's say this was of your interest to apply modern coexistence theory. So not only, on, not only assess coexistence, but understand coexistence in specifically in terms of modern coexistence theory. Mm. Then this allows now to apply to many more communities that were not possible. Um, and I think I think I would see the, the the biggest value there that we can now deal with communities that were previously outside of the reach of modern coexistence theory. Okay. But for me, it's kind of understand in the sense of of can I prove it? Can I have all the steps of the argument to finally understand it? No, no, understand it in terms of in terms of of niche infinite differences. So so is is this would be understanding. It's it's not that much. It's not that much about the assessment because, as you say, assessing that this community, well, assessing that this community has a feasible, stable equilibrium is, is relatively easy. Mm. But then, but then you want to understand well how does how does coexistence work there? Okay. Is it this is I would say is the, is the new gained advantage that so we can now do either niche and finish differences or relative nonlinearity and storage effects. Yeah. Okay. I'm just I'm I'm coming from this random matrix kind of approach, and we we think about it entirely yeah. differently. But yes. okay, I'm interested. Yes. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Oh, Sebastian, please go ahead. If, if it's okay, I just want to have a brief comment on what was just asked, which is, um, you know, it's not just math for math's sake, I would argue, but I don't think anyone here could quickly tell us whether you have coexistence or not on the slide that's being shown uh, without using the invasion graph, to be honest. So I don't think even the assessment is so simple without actually taking the time to go through the invasion graph. So if you care about whether you have coexistence or not, just as the first step, uh, that that's one of the values of the approach. And I think the other value just is that um, it now gives you a, a, a way of linking questions about community assembly to also coexistence theory. So any question you might have about community assembly, now you have a you know mathematically rigorous structure in which to order to investigate those um, sort of questions. For instance, how many end states are there here? You know, how many paths to the different end states? Um, all those things are encoded in the invasion graph. So I just want to just emphasize those extra things as some of the value in this structure. Uh, of course, I'm a proponent for obvious reasons. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, Steve, please go ahead. Um, am, am I up next? Yes. 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 Okay. So I'm, yeah, I'm also, I guess, uh, jumping in to say something about what this uh, might be worth, um, which is ecology has spent a, an enormous amount of time looking at very high diversity communities and saying, um, how um, is it possible that this is happening and trying and fierce arguments about what the mechanisms are. And um, one aspect of modern coexistence theory is it, it provides a framework for asking um, what the biological mechanisms um, are. Um, um, Alan Hastings and Evan Johnson have emphasized that, you know, any of Chesson's mechanisms sort of covers a multitude of biological mechanisms. So it's, it's not going to be a complete answer, but it narrows down. If you can get an answer to why all of these important invasion rates are positive and what, what mechanism is making them positive, it gives you some clues. It, it it, it narrows the hunt for what the biological mechanisms are underlying coexistence. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, Emmanuel, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm really interested in the model. It seems to retain the identity of each species that you are modeling such that respect of the level you are considering in the graph, it doesn't, the identity of each individual, each species is not lost. So beyond coexistence, I'm wondering if this could be applied in modeling um, ecosystem functioning, knowing that um, at each stage, you seem to have a unique community and how that could relate to ecosystem functioning as part of the relevance of your your model. Yes. So, so, hmm. so one thing that like immediately jumps to my mind is that like in ecosystem function, we have this selection effect and this complementarity and they're very often like linked to niche and fitness differences. Whereas like complementarity thought of to arise from differences in resource use, which is kind of like niche differences and fitness differences and selection effect is whether the, the abundant species occur more often, which is kind of like fitness differences. Um, the problem, so, so this, is, this is like fine conceptually, the problem that we've had to like bring this, like to, to really get this going is that modern coexistence theory has mainly done um, two species communities, right? And there is not much. So for two species community, everything is fine. And you basically can match the selection effect to fitness differences, or like at least you get the strong correlation and you get a strong correlation between niche differences and complementarity. However, what has always bothered me is that this is only for two species communities and ecosystem functioning typically focuses on, well, what happens if we increase richness? And so one kind of immediate answer to that would be, well, we now can 
finally test this? What happens if you increase species richness, right? Because previously, previously we'd only ever be able to go uh, like up to this species richness here, but everything on top here was not was kind of outside of the realm of modern Crick system theory. So we can now um, we can now do this comparison. I guess I guess more more on a larger scale, um, which is cool. And then the other thing, this is so 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 what I've just said, I've thought about this a little bit because it's also a question that has like been going around in my head for quite some time. The other thing, now that you say that, and this is completely like shooting now immediately, hoping it makes sense, is I guess you could go like like ecosystem functioning is kind of increasing the species richness. And you could you could potentially analyze each of these invasion growth rates and then decompose them into niche and fitness differences. And while you do this, you could ask, well, if the invasion growth rate has a lot of niche difference, but few fitness differences, does this imply that we get a lot of complementarity? Like, do, do, like, like if you analyze each, if you would indeed analyze each of these invasion growth rates, which we never intended to do, um, would you get some signal that whenever the invasion growth rate is mainly niche difference, then you get a lot of additional ecosystem function, whereas if it's mainly fitness difference, you do not get a lot of ecosystem function. That might be, I think I like the question. So that, that those two ideas kind of come to my mind. Does, does that help us that answer? Yes, it does. Good. Thank you so much. Uh, Steve, you wanted to say something else. Okay, yeah. Th th this time I, I, um, I have a question. Um, one of the, um, um, I guess, concerns about um, MCT and all its versions is that invasion growth rates sort of are what happens right at the boundary when you're near extinction. And sort of based on this worldview where species are constantly coming to the boundaries and persisting because they bounce back. Um, but is, um, uh, you know, there's also the other possibility that they persist because they never get close to the boundary and what happens at the boundary is completely irrelevant. Um, does this in any way help us with that conundrum that, um, that what, what happens at the boundary might not be relevant to species that never get close to it? Or is it again, sort of based on the worldview where species are constantly coming close to the boundary and only hang in there because they bounce back. So, so this, yeah, mm, I would say partially. So, and this actually goes to like, after, after we've closed the discussion with, with you, Axel, um, I realized that yes, indeed, if we have this, we have this one approach to explain diversity, which is the assumption that we have an equilibrium and that all perturbations are essentially in the, in the vicinity of this, of this equilibrium. And we have a good theory that deals with that, right? Which is basically computing the, the, the eigenvalues and that the, the largest eigenvalue deals with that. So I think we have a good theory for that that deals with, that deals with um, diversity. And then we would have, so this is on the other extreme, as you said, Steve, um, what happens if we go really far, like as far as we can from this, from this equilibrium, basically to the boundary. And then I would say we now have a good theory for there as well. So we, ha we have, I would say we now have good theories for if you're very close and we have good theories if you're very far. I would not say this. So if you, if you assume any type of continuity, of like the growth rates of the per capita growth rates, then I guess you're fine because what happens at the boundary is essentially, or what happens in between is continuously dependent on what happens on the boundary. But if you do not, if you do not want to assume this, then I don't think it tells you a lot. Yeah. But, but I would argue, well, we're fine if we're very far away from the equilibrium, we have this theory, we're fine if we have, we have, we have a theory for if we're very close to the equilibrium, and let's just hope that we do not spend a lot of time in this between. Right. Um, I don't know, Steve, if you wanted to reflect on that. We should go on. Yeah, let's 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 go on. Okay. In that case, Geza, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you. 
so uh, if the, your uh, basic uh, uh, question how to generalize something from two species for uh, many uh, species, then I think the most uh, uh, cleanest uh, uh, way of doing is the following. Uh, let's take myself to fi uh, a fixed point uh, coexistence and uh, uh, consider the linearization of the dynamics uh, near to the uh, coexistence point. And then we have an interaction matrix, and this interaction matrix is, uh, is essentially behave. Uh, uh, okay, it has a de determinant, uh, and the uh, 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 determinant is related to the local stability. Uh, uh, and in this level, uh, uh, the two species and the many species. Uh, case is not uh, uh, much different. And the two species uh, uh, determinant is uh, directly related to the niche uh, uh, overlap formula you showed uh, for two, two species. Uh, so uh, this is what I'm uh, saying is the generalization of that formula for a, 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 a arbitrary number of species, but it is uh, only for uh, local linearization uh, and uh, for stable coexistence, uh, fixed point coexistence. Now, if we are uh, interested in, okay, and then uh, uh, this determinant is related directly to the mechanism because uh, it is uh, uh, comes from the uh, way the populations in, uh, interact with the auxiliary variables, and uh, this forms this determinant, and you can say that uh, this, is, this determinant is large, so large uh, uh, segregation when uh, the interactions with the auxiliary variables are sufficiently uh, different uh, in some sense. Now, and if we are, uh, 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 and it is not invasion, it is a, a, a reply for local uh, perturbation. Now, if we uh, want to generalize it for non equilibrium uh, 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 coexistence, uh, it is uh, much more uh, complicated, of course, but uh, as uh, far as uh, Yuri and I working on the, uh, such kind of things, it is like uh, 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 some misaggregation in in uh, time uh, uh, and in in some sense it is uh, 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 biologically similar because it is corresponds to a segregation according to, uh, with respect to the uh, 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 again with the auxiliary variables but with uh, different uh, uh, auxiliary variables with different times and then if uh, you are interested in uh, invasion, then it is uh, significantly different because even for two, two species, if we uh, I, I can have a stable fixed point for uh, two species, it, it, it is still possible that this fixed point is not uh, reachable uh, uh, from the zero level uh, by some other effect, which can have uh, 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 can have some biological reason. And I think this situation is, if we want to uh, understand the mechanism level, then we have uh, to add some another mechanism uh, to, uh, uh, to the coexistence mechanism, which uh, produce this early effect. So the invasion is a, a, a correspond the difference between invasion and analysis is uh, 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 relative to the uh, fixed point stability analysis uh, uh, is that the invasion uh, problem includes more mechanistic uh, additional effects uh, relative to the another one, and uh, which can be. Uh, 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 which can be arbitrarily complicated, of course, mm -hmm. but I think this is this segregation of different uh, effects is that uh, I, I find it uh, a useful picture. Yes.
Yes, um, I thank you. Was there? Uh, I'm I'm not entirely sure. Like, did you did you hope for a reply or or you just? So, uh, I'm hoping for a lot. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Could you? Yes. Okay. So I'm not entirely sure to which part about. So could you could you phrase maybe in one or two sentences what you were hoping for a reaction? Like I I agree I basically agree with you what you said right you yes. Okay. Then I don't. Uh, if you agree, then I'm happy with that. Okay. Good. <laughs> Okay, yes. No, yeah, I, I would I would agree. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Sebastian, please go ahead. I was thinking more about Steve's question. I want to think uh want to see what your thinks of my a perspective on this. So I you know, for at least deterministic models, just to constrain the world of models a little bit. Um, one natural definition that you could advocate for coexistence is the existence of a tractor that you know at which all the points there's positive densities of all species. Um, but attractors are notoriously hard to find unless they are, one, an equilibrium, or two, you show that the system is permanent using invasion growth rates. Those are these two simplified approaches to trying to identify the existence of a coexistence attractor. So from that perspective, I view those two approaches as complementary, you know, complementary because they're one's doing things near an equilibrium, which isn't always what you care about. And the others saying what happens if you have non-equilibrium dynamics, but everything is converging to those non-equilibrium dynamics. So I'd be curious, like your what your thoughts are about these, you know, obviously very different approaches, the sort of feasible equilibrium approach of one extreme, sort of the permanence approach on the other extreme, as far as like um, to what extent are they just different? lenses onto the same question and in what ways might they be providing different information that's useful um yeah um i i guess my question is to what extent are they different lenses on the same question and to what extent are they providing different information so is, is permanence like is is it necessary for coexistence so it is this no uh, permanence would be like a global attractor, right? So just like you used to have global, you have local stability and global stability. Permanence would be you have a global attractor, right? So all initial conditions with all species present go to some global attractor, which might consist of multiple subattractors, right? Right, right. And then on the other hand, you know, of course, we all know what local stability and equilibrium is. And I was I would I would advocate that the most sort of robust definition of or, uh, or more ge general definition of coexistence for deterministic models, just the existence of an attractor. Uh, that's all the you know states in the attractor have positive densities for all the species, so it's bounded away from extinction, right? And that lies between those two worlds, right? Because right. permanence gives you, it guarantees there is an attractor, uh, and on the and you know uh, locally stable equilibrium guarantees there's a tractor, but that's not the only type of attractor, like you know the Armstrong McGee example and others. So um, so I view it as like it's it's bounding the, maybe the world we care the most about from from two different perspectives. Okay. Thanks. I would be curious about what Yurik thinks on this topic of like I mean there are these multiple approaches and are they just you know, yeah, what, what he thinks about I, I, to be honest, I hope that, so I, I, from that point of view, I hope that, that these two worlds are sufficiently similar. So I know, I know that we have models that show that, 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 that there are counter examples, right? So that these two are not the same. I know those models exist. But what I'm not yet aware of is of any empirical data that shows this kind of behavior. So my point of view is, is a very pragmatic, as long as nobody has actually measured that these, let's call them annoying characteristics actually show up, I'm gonna treat them as, as non-existent. But what about um, like, what about just predator prey cycles? That's not an equilibrium. So how, how that means they're not the same, but it is permanent for the simplest case. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, wait, what did I say? Treat them as the same. No, no, sorry, sorry. No, no, no. Um, so, 
So it was on, on one of your equilibrium. On the other hand, you have no, but you do not. So what? No, no. So the, this intermediate step, this intermediate thing, does not exist. A, um, where I guess that's my hope. Um, a case where you have these, um, where, where this invasion, uh, where this approach would fail, but you would still have an attractor. I hope my hope is that those cases are rare. Uh, I, I hate to butt in with that, but uh, no. and, and I guess it's, no, no. It's, it's stating the painfully obvious, but uh, and any LE effect would be such a case. I don't know if that's a big theoretical problem. Uh, or... No, I agree. We we that that is true. LE effects. We I guess we've had this discussion with Sebastian. And I have had these discussions back and forth. We treated them as essentially being no, but that wait. Let me think. What did we say there? We just treat it as non-existing. Okay, can you treat it as an effective boundary? No, I think we treated them. Wait, let me let me rethink. One thing we, that yeah, we, we treated them as non-existing because eventually you would have large perturbation that that would force you to the to uh, below the LE effect, and then you would die out. So an LE effect would be right that you could not that you cannot eventually eventually you will come because of stochastic effects you will come across every possible um like positive density and if you have only effects you would then crash so we treat that as or we consider that as non-existent which i agree is yeah this is a uh, I, uh, I guess uh, I, just the, the the fear or the fact might be that that there are many Real life populations that that have that. In my actually one could think that's that, true. And we just minor food for thought. Maybe the elite threshold is so low that you can effectively treat it as yes. a boundary. Yes, that that is yes, yes. Uh, but uh, sorry, in, in any case, Axel wanted to say something for a long time now. Uh, yes, sorry, I I'm trying to uh, how can we unify different approaches to ecology, I was thinking about this, and staring at these graphs, I had some idea. So let me say it. Um, when, we, when you have a um, species pool, which is much larger than the local biodiversity that you can ever sustain, then, um, then you get turnover all the time. Kind of, some species invades, another goes extinct, another species invades. And you would, in this graph, you would see these loops that you say, oh, I don't want to look at loops, but you would see loops. And um, what what we are trying to understand is at the, if you have lots and lots of species, it's just permanent per internal. But if you have not so many, you get some equilibrium like you have here. And there's a transition where you start to get these loops. And I'm, we're trying to understand what is happening there. And my question to you is: if I if I have give you a, a, a very large like 300 by 300 interaction matrix and a lot of terror system. How, how difficult it is to calculate these graphs that I can analyze them. So, so the graph has um, two to the power of species nodes. Okay, that's very large. That is very large. Yeah. <laughs> we, so there is, so, no, so that, that's, that's not necessarily true, right? So it could have, basically this, this is, I get this, this is how I kind of treat it. It, it can't have a lot fewer if you assume that coexistence is rare, right? Then you would get the much sparser graph. That would be in my case, so yes. So if you have very, very sparse, then, so we've, yeah, so, so the problem really is computing the entire graph if you have 300 species, even if the graph is like only a fraction of two to the power 300, it's still, it's, it's, it's you cannot deal with that, right? Mm -hmm. So one way would be, and I think this, this would be kind of the pragmatic approach is you simulate the densities over time, but you said you don't even have an equilibrium, right? You, or you, you but, would have- But um, your algorithm is in a, efficient in a sense that it would be faster than my naive approach of doing it. No, so, it's, no, so, so the algorithm that we've, that we've implemented is just, it, it computes all the possible sub-communities, so for mm -hmm. lot of you take all the possible subcommunities. So in this case, it would indeed be two to the power of three hundred, okay. and then invert all the matrices, 
to see, well, I guess it wouldn't because it would not even come up with the list, but in theory, the algorithm would then compute invert all the matrices, which would take another infinity on top of the already infinity that you have. So you would know what, um, what I've done so far is I'm, I'm, I'm writing like a proposal to indeed do this with like a hundred species is I run the simulations. Um, I run the simulations densities over time, then I get an equilibrium. I, I assume that I, you said, right, you are in this, at some point you have this transition where the equilibrium doesn't exist anymore. If the equilibrium doesn't work, well, you do not get a permanent community, rather right? you have this species come in and out all the time. Mm -hmm. If you are in that case, I guess I would give up from all the coexistence theory point of view. So I've, I've, I've restricted myself mm -hmm. to the case where this does not happen. So when this does not happen, you can simulate the densities until you've reached an equilibrium, which may or may not be unique. Um, and then from this community, you have your like your, your local community, and then you can take one species out, ask whether you would get an, an invasion graph. Mm -hmm. and you basically you only do the top layer of the invasion graph. And then you kind of resort back to what we've always been doing, to be honest. Okay. But anyway, maybe maybe useful to see if 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 there can a connection can be made at this point because this invasion graph is this thing that they, all these have in common. Yes. Cool. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks so much. Uh, are there any other comments or questions? There was a question in the chat, Gary. Oh, thank you. Uh, oh yeah, there are a lot of. Oh, in R, I will be over to, 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 whoa, let's see. Oh, yeah. Okay, wait, so thanks for it. In R, I have found that you can uh, do communities with 15 species that are so easily, but. Yeah, that's not a question. Oh. And it was just a comment. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. I, think, I think we've done, the I've once done it with species in python and it took about an hour which is like you know you can't do that but um and then this so i think we've not uploaded it yet right sebastian we've not uploaded our code yet uh well the the art code for the paper with joseph has been up on i forgot which one zenodo or something which does tell you how to compute invasion graphs and plot them and so forth um but our code yeah our our code uh I, i'm i don't think has been uh it hasn't okay, so been. we're so we'll do that soon i guess yeah sure the answer i could i know what i'll do i'll do i'll add a uh, a comment on below the youtube thingy where the code is yeah i mean it's already the r is already with the paper with joseph yes. so it, only be, it would mainly be python I suppose you have to be on the boundary when the community is first assembling. Yes. Yes. Um. Yeah, okay. Uh, thanks for that. And any other questions or comments? If not, then thank you again, you for the presentation and everyone for participating yes. and taking part of the conversation. Thank you very much for the invitation. You're very welcome. Uh, thank you for coming. And then uh, the next iteration is in uh, uh, a few weeks. I don't know off the top of my head. Next, next week. Sorry? Next week. Oh, next, <laughs> scratch that, next week. <laughs> We are on. We are on a roll. Okay. So we'll see you then. Uh, until then, uh, take care. See you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.